Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this engineering Q&A session. Uh, these events are organized by Plato. One quick word about Plato is it's a mentorship platform for engineering leaders, and uh, you could check it out at platohq.com for more information. My name is Joe Harper. I'm a senior director of engineering at Sheer ID. It's a marketing identity platform. We uh, offer gated communities. Uh, we help uh, customers with offers to gated communities like military, student, healthcare, healthcare workers, and other influential consumer communities. Um, and with me today is Ian, Ian Nolan from Datadog. Uh, he's going to hear present uh, at Jerry QA about uh, thinking big, but not too big, learnings from AWS and Datadog. Ian, uh, hey, glad to meet you. So as Joe said, my name's Ian Noland. I'm a SVP of Core Engineering at Datadog. Uh, I manage about 650 people today. Uh, Datadog, hopefully you know it, but we're an observability platform. Our, our target is generally software engineers and software engineering teams. Um, my career, I've been in the industry about 23 years now. Um, uh, about half of it as a manager, about half of it as an engineer, and then a lot of it in the US. I moved to the US in 2006 from Australia, spent 10 years at Amazon, and, and really a lot of learnings from this talk are coming from Amazon. But then the last six years, I've been in New York uh, at a couple of companies. Um, and, and so a lot of what I've, I've learned is sort of reflecting on those learnings in, the, in the, uh, what they mean in other companies, not just within the Amazon culture. So I'm happy to share them today. Uh, so thank you. Awesome. So thank you very much, Ian, for joining us. I think you have a couple of slides you'd like to go through before we open it up for questions. Audience, please feel free to begin adding and upvoting questions in the Q&A tab. Ian, take it away, my friend. Okay. Great, you can see the slide. So as I said, this, this talk is thinking big, and but not too big. And for those who uh, uh, don't know Amazon well, like Amazon is a company with incredibly clear company values. They've been called cultish by some people, but the company values. And part of the thing is this think big is one of those company values. And so this is the, the, the talk title is me trying to emphasize that the Amazon stuff is actually good, but put it into context of like how companies that don't have this type of company value can still get things done. Um, so start, I've sort of already covered my background. Uh, I, I won't go through this again. So, but, but, you know, about 12 years as a manager now. And this is sort of aimed, I, I think, hopefully at like more senior engineers trying to build a uh, second version of uh, systems, but also at managers trying to trying to get approvals for these types of systems. And so, so sort of, you know, the problem that I'm trying to address with this talk is how do you convince your management to let you build a V2? And, and I want to set it up. I think we all see this in any of our careers, which is, we generally have systems that were built, you know, three to five years ago. They're generally serving the business well, the current business pretty well today. But, but we're, we're constantly beset by the fact that either they're architected for things that the business want things, but they're just not architected for. And you can sort of wedge them in, but you're just incurring more and more tech debt the more you wedge them in. Oftentimes what you have with these systems is they have uh, reliability issues. They were built for a smaller scale, a simpler world. The business has outgrown them. Um, and so... So, you know, you try and take a conservative approach. You do this incremental addition. But generally, because of all this debt tech that is, exists in these systems, you, this slowness both makes the business unhappy. They wonder why you can't ship features quicker. It makes your engineers really unhappy because they feel unproductive and they feel they are actually going to be on your system. Then I think what we find, we all tend to find is we, we try and pitch V2 systems to management. Or maybe now we're managers and we have to evaluate these pitches of V2 systems. And the constant pushback you get is, well, I don't think this is going to be worth the cost. This is going to be yet another new thing. And hey, I can point to all these other examples at the company where we tried to build a V2 and it totally failed. And so there's generally two models when people pitch V2s. You need to get a business first or a platform first model. So business first is you usually look at you know the hot business, the one that's growing really fast. Uh, what you tend to do is often build it within that business first team. And, and the problem is often they're greatly successful within the area of a business, uh, the new area of a business. And, you know, everyone is really, really excited about what it could be. But in building the, for the hot business, they've never really thought about the legacy use cases at all. So, so basically what they've left is this tremendous amount of uh, mismatch maybe between what they've built and what is really needed to deprecate the V1 system. So that's often why business first fails. Struggling with platform first, so the platform team who owns the current platform is trying to build the new platform, is they just struggle to show time in business value. Like they've got this massive weight around their neck of the current system that they have to keep running and serving customers. Uh, and, and that takes engineering time just to keep that going. And then they have to sort of carve out to build the new one. And they, they constantly struggle with this chicken and egg problem. They're, they're always asking for more headcount to build the second system. But the business sort of says, 
well, we can't do that until you've proven yourself. And, and so, so you're just left sort of with this inability to actually get the amount of people on the system uh, to actually help, help you succeed. So this is uh, sort of my solution. And I don't want to pretend that this always works. Um, and sometimes what you have to face is that some systems just shouldn't be replaced. It doesn't make sense. So what, what I talk about here is what has worked for me sort of at AWS when I learned of AWS and sort of carry it over to Datadog in terms of sort of balancing that platform first and business first approach. And so, so the first thing is think big. And like the, you know, the, the interesting thing for this for me is this, the most amount of feedback I got in my first five years at Amazon was, Ian, you don't think big enough. And, and it was really ironic for me because I would look around and say, there's too many assholes around here thinking way too big. Like I, I can think of a very, uh, good incremental improvement for a V2 system and you won't let me build it. And what I never really understood is every single engineer at the company sort of thought that. And, and like, it's, so it's not really compelling to hear from an engineer, just I could improve the current system. And so thinking big was this idea, sort of stepping back and seeing where things are going. And so it has a narrative sort of approach to it, as well as an engineering approach. And I'll, I'll cover both. So, so a narrative approach, you know, when I really analyze, and, and I'll, I'll talk about it, specific examples, really good examples I learned later. When, when I learned people who are really good at like selling this story of thinking big, a lot of what they were doing was taking like the feature ask that they knew that they were getting that the business needs in the next 12 months. And they're really just assuming success. They're really just projecting out, okay, let's imagine we get momentum at this. Like what, what else can the business, uh, you know, within the business, uh, what other workloads can we take? But what else could the business just be serving if we assume success? And so, so they were really great at creating this story of, okay, if we presume success, this is going to be like a snowball that's going to steadily expand. And so the, a really useful technique, and this I, I learned a bit later, was this observation of like, What's inevitable if the business is successful that we should take a bet on? And because the business might not be successful. So, so that, that's the bet aspect. But if, if the business just keeps getting momentum, well, what, what is going to be acceptable? So this is, I, I think of as like the story. This is the narrative approach of thinking big. The other thing, and this is definitely something that I struggle with as well. Like, and, and I definitely have engineers today who pitch me projects. And it's usually like, I, I can pay down, I can build a much more reliable system that two years from now, we're going to find it much more easy to add features. And I go, look, that's not a justification for building for building a new system. Like there's too much cost. We, we can address that cost by just incrementally improving the current system. So what I've got here is a list of four things. So above the reliability and the ability to like easily iterate on new features, you really have to find some day one type wins on either cost efficiency or, uh, or, or fundamental capabilities that the old system just can't do. Well, once you can, so I don't think you have to have all four of these, but I do think you want to have at least three of these like identified on day one to really be sure that moving to V2 is, is the, is the right thing to do. So, so this, this is sort of, uh, all the thinking big. So this is the first thing to like working out, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to do a V2. Okay. So, so then there's this step two, and this is part of why these steps are tied is because this can be an iterative process. And so this just gets back to it. I think we all sort of know that it, unless you're iteratively delivering business value, it's very hard to justify your value. Like it, it's fine to tell people to wait 12 months to see some real business impact from what you're doing. It's very hard for people to understand, oh, wait two years, wait three years. And so, so if you look at the problem, like often when you see these pictures the first time, the first thing is just duplicating the current system. So not adding any new capabilities. It might be a bit more reliable, just duplicating the current system. Then it's like this big rollout phase. Then in about year three, you start seeing, oh, now, now we get to get to win. From everything that we uh, that we've invested in, and, and that's just too long for a business process to be sure. And, and so sometimes engineers get upset by this. They think it's it's really irrational with businesses to to, to want iteration because it means uh, you often have to settle for less than you know things take longer if you want to iterate. But the challenge is again, everyone has value. Right? There's this term from economics I really like, which is opportunity cost. Right? If, if I'm investing in a V2 system in one place, just given the nature that headcount is not infinite. There's an, someone else wanting to be able to be who I have to say no to. And, and so it is fairly rational for a business that has to have people agreeing with what we're investing in and why to expect iterative delivery. And so, so, so part of what you do, you have to take as an engineer is you just have to accept this. That like maybe it will take four years instead of three years. But if it's four years and constantly showing iterative value to the company, that's how you get buy in to actually let you do it. It's when you start wanting to delay forever. Uh, to show the initial value, delay for a long time to show initial value, that businesses have a really hard time believing that uh, that it's going to pay off for them. Um, so, so this is, you know, this just gets down to usual scoping stuff. 12 months is nominal. 12 months, though, served me well at Amazon, uh, definitely served me well at the company since Amazon. It's about the amount of time people can wait 
wait for something substantial to be delivered. And so, so the way to think of it, though, when, you know, when you're making these compromises to find this thing that can do be done in 12 months, there's this guy, Jim Keller, who has been in the chip industry in various, like, hugely successful way. And he talks about the bones of the architecture. And so every 12 months, not only do you want to be delivering business value, you want to be delivering the next set of bones for the architecture, the things that you know are going to show compound interest as you iterate over time. If you can find the right balance between these things, then, then you have a great V2 system. You have a great pitch to, hey, over three to four years, we're, we're finally going to get there. And so, so again, this is, sounds pretty simple, but I, I want to like relate it now to a couple of examples, especially like the iterative approach sometimes that you have to take uh, to finding the, the right uh, the right goals here. So I'm going to start. So uh, EC2 Nitro was the main thing I spent, I, I think about seven of my years in EC2 was working on this new platform. I was basically the leader for it. Um, I, I don't expect everyone here to know EC2, what EC2 Nitro is, so I'm going to run through it quickly. It was basically a, what, what this pitch is supposed to represent is it's a computer within a computer. So when everyone was doing virtualized computing originally, they were basically just running all the virtualization layer on the exact same CPU as a user. The big problem with that is you can't ever get to bare metal performance. You're always taking away some amount of uh, the cores to basically do it. So it was basically the idea of just offloading that. Uh, I have I, I point to James Hamilton. James was the project sponsor, you know, all the advice and, and a large part of what makes this talk just comes from listening to James over the course of about five years. But really all it was doing was taking a whole bunch of virtualization software that was running on the cust on the CPU the customer ran on and moving that to a different CPU uh, that would purely ran the, the virtualization layer. So uh, it took a long time, as you said, this was like, uh, probably seven to eight years from the initial patterns to actually show uh, value. I show, I, I led it for four years and I was delivering uh, delivering for four years. Okay, so, so let's now apply the framework that we talked about um, to, to it. So, uh, James, so, so James's observation with Nitro, and he talks about this publicly, by the way. So way back in 2009, I think, when he got to Amazon, it's like Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are outpacing all other server growth. So he related that back to the 70s, where everyone was uh, was uh, diversifying vertically across the stack, all these things. And he was like, well, Amazon should start doing that too. E EC2 should start vertically integrate. And if we vertically integrate, like we could just imagine moving all this software to hardware. And that's, that was like the history of the 70s. So, so how do we start doing that? And so so he basically had this big, big thing. EC2 can get to bare metal performance. Like you know, he had the, if you, if you uh, can't, if you're not bare metal performance, you'll never be able to compete with bare metal performance. So how, how would you win the data center? So, so the big thing is though, this was like way too big. Like we scoped it out and it was way too big. So, so he, he, had, he, we first tried to scope it down. Can we find a subset to deliver sooner? And we sort of found the network. Can we just get network to bear, uh, bear metal performance? We sort of scoped that out and we still worked out that it was going to be five years to actually get EC2 to be bare metal network performance. And so it was still way too big, uh, for a first iteration. So we went back to the drawing board. Now his observation was, uh, okay. Networking has very many different aspects to it, but if you just say that to the fact that people are building more and more distributed system, it's basically throughput and latency that people care the most about. So can we get just throughput and latency down to bare metal performance? And so, so the subset that we found was basically, so it wasn't even full throughput, it was basically packet rate and latency. Uh, that was the reason why some EC2 customers were leaving. So the question was, in one year, can we deliver substantial wins on that? We did some scoping. We worked it out to be about a five person team, 12 months. And it was like, go. That was basically the first iteration became the C3 instance type in 2013. Uh, but that was the, the first iteration. We repeated this now, uh, for multiple times after that. Rather than talk about EC2 though, cause that's of course it has become a very, very big business. I wanted to bring one back to Datadog. So Datadog, as we talked about, uh, we, we're doing observability, um, 12 year old company. Uh, the one of the main things with Datadog for eight years, it was just a single product. Uh, and it was only really that we started to get momentum into the new ones really in the last three to four years. So, so with Datadog, what we sort of started, what we basically observed is there's very little difference between the data we gather for observability and things that other customers like non-software engineers, business users might want in the company. And so, so we need to pivot Datadog. Datadog needs to stop focusing so much on pure observability data and become a general data platform. And of course, uh, that, that again is a massive bet. That's like a five year, 10 year type thing for Datadog. So, okay, we go, can we find a subset that values sooner? Here's a case though, where we start thinking too small. We found our APM and logs products that were fairly new at the point. They had a lot of common needs. So we're like, okay, can we just consolidate software engineering between these two teams and build a common platform? And what we found is we could do that, but we weren't really getting any wins for the business at all. Uh, like we could, like we would then have to just like after the first year of integrating these two teams together, 
everything good was gonna was gonna come later. So so iteration one, iteration one didn't work. So iteration two was just this more general observation that uh, most observability data, uh, developer did observability data is never read. Um, and so there's a lot of systems, uh, you know, I think I called out Elasticsearch here. I built for, uh, uh, for read write workloads that are basically e equal, but I'm actually that well set up for observability data uh, when 90% of data is, is never actually read after it's been written. And so, so basically we found the, the thing is, okay, we need to replace our entire data pipeline to make it far more cost efficient for these, uh, read wet rarely workloads. Um, and, and basically when we looked at the subset that we could deliver sooner, we looked hard at Elasticsearch and said, like, like, you know, I, I don't want to say we're unique in the industry. Lots of people are realizing this. Hey, if, if we move to a columnar store on S3, S3 is, uh, very, very good at high durability data that you need to be sure is there, but may not be read for a far amount, of, a long amount of time. So, so basically we, we looked at it and we scoped and we said, can, can we build something that does this? And again, we looked for a small team. Uh, we, we looked for a small team and, and we looked hard. We actually dropped logs from the in initial requirements and looked hard at APM and said, hey, in 12 months, can a team of three to five deliver this first iteration? And so, so we did. Uh, we actually have a public blog post about it. This is a system called Husky. Uh, but this was, again, was by iterating on the Think Big, we were able to come back to something that actually allowed us to build the V2 platform. Uh, and so with that, I actually, that was all the slides that I have to prepare. I wanted to leave as much time as I could for questions. And so I'll hand it back to, to Joe. Hello, everybody. Please feel free, if you have any questions, to add them to the Q&A tab. And feel free to also upvote questions that you see there that you really like to see answered. But while you all do that, in the meantime, uh, let me, while you, uh, uh, before I get to the audience questions, I have one of my own, Ian. Um, one of the challenges that I have ran into when working on a new platform is dealing with the fact that the current platform is constantly changing with the discovery of bugs, scaling improvements, new customers come online. Um, do you have any advice for how to build and iterate on a new platform while continuing to make sure it can address the ever-changing problems that the V1 is experiencing? I think the, the first bit of advice is, is like, it's almost impossible, I think, for any engineer that I've ever observed to spend a lot of their time keeping one system running and incrementally going and then spend half their week working on a completely new system that has all new problems. And, it, uh, you know, it's, it's much more about like architecture. Like you, you're asking a lot from any engineer. So yeah. Amazon introduced this term, which I actually thought was standard, but some people have told me is it like the notion of a tiger team. And, and if you look at how I've, how I've seen success here, it's always carving off. It doesn't necessarily be a team. It might just be one engineer. But the first thing is carving off someone who is going to hit that incremental goal and just realizing that might be part of why you have to scope down that incremental goal because three quarters of the engineers have to stay working the existing system. So I think, I think the hard thing yeah. you're forcing yourself as a manager there is to be very specific about where that dial is about exist, uh, investment in the existing system versus investment in new thing. Now, the other thing that, and I've definitely seen this fail and I definitely personally work hard to do it. So, so then you've created like an A team, B team problem. You've got a bunch of engineers working on the old system, a bunch of engineers working on the new system. The new system is cool. Like that's just the nature of engineering, right? <laughs> if, if you as a manager work really hard to keep relationships strong and make everyone feel like in a year and a half, you know, in, in, a, in a year, for the first year and a half, all this engineering is equally valuable, even though some might be more fun than the other. But, but in a year and a half, hey, we're all going to work on this. So, so if you work really hard to keep the relationship strong, I find engineers, you know, we're, we're very rational people. We're, we're, we're fine with it. Where I find it gets very negative, if you take those teams and build, put them too far apart in the org and have a manager not trying to keep relationships good, then it can become very, very negative because the, the team who has the system in production knows far more about the real business cases than the team building a new system. So, so unless they're sharing knowledge, you're going to run into a problem. But, but I do find it's best to try and carve off the engineers basically because they need to focus and because it does make the uh, you know, the investment allocation explicit rather than <laughs> implicit and best effort, which I, I find you end up disappointing both both audiences. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Especially when you can you know explicitly say this is how much it costs to build this new system. I keep it combined. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Great. Great, great answer. And I especially appreciated in the presentation the great examples you provided. I, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I personally learned from examples. So thank you for that. That's, that was awesome. All right. So let's get to our first question from Austin Story. Um, do you use KPIs to guide teams and how do you select them? Yeah, this is a, this is a, it's a good question. It's very, very controversial, I'd say, across management. Like you read a lot, say SLOs as a certain form of KPIs. There's lots of people who, uh, you think you should be measuring as much as you can about software engineering teams. How else do you know if it's happened? 
I, I have like there's this old uh, essay, the magic number is seven plus or minus two. My, my thing is, if you have twenty important things, you have no important things. So if you have twenty KPIs, you have no KPIs. And so when I focus about when I think about KPIs, I think about what problem do I have today uh, that I want. Especially you know when I when you're two or three layers up on leadership, I want to keep a pulse on. And so a classic one I think in anyone doing true DevOps is always the reliability side. Uh, and, and so it's much less like I actually care far more about rather than a true SLO about availability, much more about incident rate. Like, so, so that's an example of one where what I find, especially this might be the ex Amazonian. Like I, you've seen, I saw pr very productive teams hit a pager rate of like 10 pages a week and burn themselves out in the course of six months. And, and it's very, very hard sometimes for early layers of management to protect because all they're hearing is ship features fast. And, you know, and once we get this out the door, then we have time to fix things. So, so I'd say what I select them for personally, I keep the numbers small and I make sure they're solving pertinent problems that I care about today. And that might mean I, I uh, abandon them 12 months from now. And I, I have to explain to people, look, that was important to the problems we had in the past. Uh, that's what we do. I, I do sort of, uh, you know, you can find me sort of blogging on, on Medium where I, I list off some KPIs that I've definitely used in the past, particularly around operations, but in other areas. But, but I am, very, compared to some other leaders, I'm very selective. I, I want them to be solving a problem as opposed to making me feel good that I'm measuring as a manager. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. Really good point. Um, Another question from Anonymous. What uh, are the critical signs that you need to move to a V2 ASAP? <laughs> I'd say it's, uh, it's it's an interesting question. Like, and it's, it's uh, I saw another question. Like, so, so part of it is like, if you buy my, my rule, which again, it wasn't, it wasn't really at a start. This is probably Datadog, even when I got here was 300 plus and, and, and right, like where, where 12 months was reasonable. I, I think what it is, again, is it's this sense that uh, it's, it's incredibly compelling for the business mission, uh, to get it. The thing you have to realize with the V2 is it's going to take three to four years to really compete. Like, even when I joined Datadog, big initiatives were taking that long, uh, because they just were growing so fast. So, so I, I think what it is, is a burning sense that if we don't solve this, the business in three years won't exist. I, I think that's the easiest one to convince yourself that the V2 is actually worth it. Because you can always invest in the V1. Like, you can always incrementally improve things. People will grow. But, you know, the industry is, there's a lot of old software in the industry and things haven't fallen apart. So, so it's really that being very convinced the business needs this to succeed, that would make me move very, very quickly. Otherwise, it's more like evaluating against the list of opportunities and just finding the highest leverage ones. So, so it's, it's much more of a judgment than a, 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 a selective judgment than an individual case judgment. <laughs> That's a really good point. And, and I know from my experience, yeah, I mean, as you pointed out in the talk, that business can run out of patience when you're running a V2 if you're not uh, prov providing value right away and iterating on that. So um, that's a really good point. Uh, another question, what engineering skills and processes are necessary to start building a successful platform from an existing product? Skill. I do think, so, so I think one thing you need, part of it is like, what does the next, the V2 look like? I, mm -hmm. I've, uh, I, in other things when I've sort of looked at this is often a V2 system. Often what you run into is V1 is pure open source. Like you're just leveraging the hell out of open source. V, V2 is then sort of scaffolding around open source. So, so you're still using, and this is a classic example. You might move from Cassandra to RocksDB, but then suddenly you're writing a lot more code. V2 to V3, suddenly you're in-housing a lot um, to actually do. So I, I think the first thing is some sense of, you know, does it, whether you need more of a, a plumber who's going to iterate fast uh, to get things out, or whether you need more pure software. And I, I think that's very case specific. Um, I, I think there's a tendency, you know, we all know this. I think we know there's a tendency of all engineers to maybe think way too big and want to write as much code as they can in the V2. And, and that's great. Again, if you have, if, if you're Google scale, probably in-housing everything makes a lot of sense. But most of us aren't. And, and so a lot of what you want is some amount of pragmatism. Uh, so, so it's this balance between, usually engineering for the next order of scale, which usually attracts the idealist, but pragmatism to actually want to deliver in 12 months rather than build the perfect thing. So, so I think it's, one of, it's probably one of those, you know, uh, no, there's no perfect thing. And it's often why one person often isn't the right number just to do this, but two people with contrasting styles, even though there'll sometimes be conflict, that is forcing, uh, forcing again, the, the think too big versus the thinking too small type uh, dynamic to actually be evaluated. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, very true. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I think one time I made the mistake of having one engineer kind of on an island doing that, and yeah, uh, needless to say, without that kind of conversation or talking about it between other and getting other perspectives, the project was just kept on going. It wouldn't stop. You know, yeah. they, they they just weren't weren't any checks in place, right? Yeah, I completely agree. And it's like one of the like the hardest thing is this twelve months. Like if you go beyond it, and this is, I think Amazon yeah. was very good at this, but Amazon has a very it's, it's a very driven culture. Is, are you willing to actually kill it if it hasn't? And, and it's very, very hard because you hit that 12 months and the engineer tells you one month more and then you think it might be three months more, but you're okay with that. But then it takes six months more and you've made a bad decision. And so, yeah, so yeah you, you do need that pragmatism because, yeah, everyone's going to have, you know, once I get past this next thing, I yell, we'll totally be ready for production. So, so it's, yeah, you, you need both mindsets. <laughs> no, that's a really good point. Um, given the split uh, between new versus uh Oh, sorry, sorry. Given the split, new versus maintenance, how do you keep folks motivated on maintaining the existing system? I think you talked a little bit about this earlier about the Tiger team and and how to keep people happy. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one I think early managers struggle with themselves on because often they get most interested in the V two system. So, so yeah. one one thing you sort of learn as a manager over time is your team responds to your focus. If you're spending all your time with yourself thinking about the V2 system and your leader's time is asking all the time, well, when's that V2 system going to be done? Like, oh, everyone working on the V1 is going to get a pretty good sense that they're not that valued. And so the first thing is making sure you and the chain above you equally values the contributions. And what you'll find is people will, will be okay with that. Like, again, what they won't like is when all the value seems to go to the V2 system. Other thing just as important is like everyone's at a different stage of their career in terms of what skills they need to learn, how they need to grow. You, you will tend to put earlier career engineers on the V1 system a lot of the time. And that's completely fine as long as they're getting mentorship maybe from the V2 engineers. So that again, they're still growing. So then you can appeal to like maybe their, their growth motivation as opposed to just the, I need to build the coolest thing. And, and I do find like if management invests in this, like it sounds crazy because we've all seen it fall apart. But if management does invest in this, I have seen it succeed a lot of the times. But it does take managers caring equally. Uh, and particularly, I think sometimes you can care equally, but your manager doesn't. And you have to go tell them, look, if you're not showing value to both sides, you're making things worse for me. And that's, that's a conversation. Again, you probably have to bring it up a lot, but they can hear it and, and change their actions. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. And even help driving them towards, you know, ha- ha- how do we uh, systematically uh, uh, recognize these efforts and making sure that there's these, you know, shout outs or how people like to be rewarded, right? How, how do we make sure that we keep on calling out these great, great efforts, especially from the maintenance teams? Um, another question from Neil, uh, given the split, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, uh, the, different question, sorry, anonymous, uh, 12 months seems like a long time for a startup. How do you keep engagement motivation up? In the meantime, yeah. So, so, so I think there's two parts of this, and like one. So, you know, when, when I joined Datadog, it was about 350 engineers, and for them, three months was a long time. Even as it was clear that dumb stuff was taking 12 months to three years to actually show. So, so part of it though was what Datadog had become used to. I, I think when you have less than 100 years, probably 12 months is the wrong way to think of it, and you should be really thinking more three months is your duration period. Um, and, and that maybe like again. Maybe the, the general answer here is you need to observe how much tolerance is for gratification delay of the business in whatever business you're in. And that needs to be a iteration period regardless. And so I do find bigger companies, it's more like 12 months. Uh, but yeah, if you have a hundred person startup, it's more like three months. And then you just have to work out how do I deliver business value every three months? How do I keep it really, if it's going to take me six months, how do I keep it really small? Uh, but then, then you have to start incrementing and showing value. I, I don't think there's any part, part of what I guess I'd stress is there's no, the, when business, when, when de- demonstration, social success around business value works well, it's a self-fulfilling cycle. People get excited. People, people know they have to wait, but they get excited of what they've seen in the past. But when it becomes really, really difficult is when it just seems like endless delay and no value. So I'd say first, maybe reduce this cycle. And then within that, just iterate. Uh, and again, force yourself to deliver business value sooner, which again, will feel compromising, but I, I don't think it's escapable uh, in most mm. companies. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have another good question from uh, Ken. Uh, what about those system? What about those systems that are uh, in the uncanny valley, very annoying, but are not at a key point in the system where you can generate a super compelling 50% or better use case uh, to justify the expense and effort? 
Yeah, this is, I mean, this is sort of maybe the bitter question, but it's like my observation is you have to just invest incrementally and wait. And, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's tough because it's often this, these systems are frustrating. They're the ones that pay you at three o'clock in the morning. They often have the most tech there. Um, the thing, especially like having managed a lot more people the last four years of my career though, is opportunities are endless, but the future is unknown. And so if the, the worry you have, and this might be why there's so many sort of abandoned B2s across the industry. If you start too soon and then something changes in the business and something better comes along, but you didn't think about it, you've actually made a bad decision. And so part of it is, again, this is different. A very stable business is diff different, but most of us working up businesses that are growing a lot. So I, I do think as hard as it is, it is the right thing to do is to wait until there is this strong impetus that makes it very, very clear to everyone that you need the V2. I, it's, I just struggled in my career to point to successes that ever tried to go early. Like it, it's just, it's just very, very difficult in, in, in our industry, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I think most of the biggest mistakes in my past have been triggering a V2 too early and yeah, waiting for delivering on that value, watching the engineer say, yeah, it's, you know, a couple months away and only to find it's longer and longer. Um, it's a hard thing to do. Um, how about a uh, good question from Steve Rogers. How do you tie the cost of building a V2 to an actual business value and determining an ROI? Um, things like efficiency, reliability can be hard to quantify. Totally agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, there's different. There's, so there's two aspects of this. I, I think, honestly, efficiency and reliability are often easier than even the true one, which is feature value. <laughs> like feature value is the one across my career. You talk to yeah. businesses and like everyone thinks some new market will open with some new feature. And like I, I'm in a SaaS company. Like it's not even like at least I'm selling a product. A lot of us work have worked in places where you're like four or five degrees removed from revenue. And so it's up. I think efficiency or liability, like it is like when I've done this, uh, it is going to the numbers. Like so it is actually uh, trying to do some amount, like often a one month scope prototype and actually show is that, hey, it's, say an EC2 Nitro, this was an easy one, right? When you were spending 5,000 cycles per packet, we did a quick POC showing 500 cycles per packet. That was 10x. We didn't hit that. We ended up hitting 1,000 cycles per packet. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was actually fairly numeric, though. At least, at least we had some sense that the the goal was there. Similar for reliability, like I, I, this might tie back to my earlier answer with KPIs. I, I really don't like talking about nines. I love talking about failure modes prevented, right? Like So so I, I think you can be far more concrete. Oh, this allows us to take an AZ outage. This allows us to take S3 being down, and yet we still serve answers. I think the more mm -hmm. that you can talk about those things, sort of cause, again, because a lot of times they tie to architecture, they'd be very hard to wedge in. I think then you can talk about them likely uh, affecting the nine. I think the more you get into this abstract measurement of nines, I, yeah, I find it very hard to compare systems because people, th there's a lot that goes into one system being four nines and three nines, and a lot of it's just in the eye of the beholder. Um, so, <laughs> so again, architecture, architectural improvements, I do think. Business value, I think you try really hard to find a business advocate who, who thinks, you know, who wants to vouch for you. And like, they might be wrong. This is partly why it's a bet, but, but at least you have, like, it's always, if you can hit that sort of hockey curve, at least you have some sense, right? That there's momentum there and it might turn out to be wrong. Like actually, you know, one bet we took at one point on EC2 was that we thought other companies might want to work with us on a, on using their hypervisor and then they just pulled out. And so that turned out to be a bad bet, but we pivoted actually to, to a second goal after that. So but by finding a business advocate, again, in, in my own, like we have product engineering and product management, the more that they're advocating for your, your new architecture, I, I find that that's a large part of itself. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and one of the, the biggest problems I've found with nines is, you know, sometimes that is motivated engineering to try to create a lot of redundant systems, which then ignores the, your mean time to recovery. Like, you yeah. know, when you're when a problem goes wrong, you know, how do you troubleshoot the more complexity to the system there is? just the bigger pain in the ass to, to try to get things back. Um, so, so that, you know, that's a really good point. And uh, so we have another question, um, Anonymous. What is your take on Meta, um, previously Facebook, current strategy? Um, Mark puts out a grand plan to build Metaverse in 10 years. Is he thinking too big? If you were in his shoes, how would you approach this? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm completely unqualified <laughs> to answer this question, but I'll, I'll give an opinion anyway. M my view of what Zuckerberg's doing is he sees Google and Apple as existential threats, and he thinks that, like, his Facebook is really going to be meaningful in 10 years. This is his way. Like, of course, he tried the phone at one point. I, I think that failed. So, so from a strategic viewpoint, I think what he's doing, and he sees, like, a lack of maybe investment. He thinks maybe they, uh, Facebook's culture is going to be unique at getting there. 
So strategically, that makes a lot of sense. I think the challenge is like, you know, most of the org doesn't care. Like there's this thing where the classic example, right? Like why did Microsoft struggle so long at the cloud for so long? It's because most of the business cared about building Microsoft and Office licenses. Why does Facebook like sort of have this, like even internally, you talk to Facebook people, why do they have this love-hate relationship with Metaverse? Because most of them care about Facebook.com. And so, so, so I understand the strategy. I, I think, you know, it's the thing that a strong CEO who's very empowered by his board can take. Uh, you know, I, I'm not buying a lot of Facebook stocks. <laughs> so I, I, I maybe think it's going to be more disruptive than a big company is able to do. But I do understand why he's trying to do it. Like it, it's, he just sees this existential threat of Apple and Google sort of uh, capture, maybe Amazon capturing all the data and Facebook just being off in this niche and being a much smaller company. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's a good observation. Um, a good question from Merv. Uh, there are communication problems between PMs, designer, devs, QAs. Yes, uh, we've being in management, we're, we, we're around this a lot. So how do you manage to solve these communication issues and the communication overhead? I, I think everyone in the industry can answer badly. Uh, yeah. so, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> so there's this interesting observation, I think, about software development compared to other professions, that we have the most teamwork. Like you talk to a doctor, they're not trying to collaborate with 20 other doctors to get anything done. So we've taken this profession and not only are we collaborating with other people who do the exact same thing as us, we have to collaborate with other professions who don't do the thing that we do. And that, that just means there's a lot of communication overhead to, to getting these right. It, it's why like most startups, you know, they say fungible, fungible, fungible is because mm -hmm. part of the way you, you solve this is by keeping the number of stakeholders with uh, as small as possible and challenging them to do the broadest possible role. Now we all outgrow that. Like everyone, you know, the, the benefits of specialization, right, is in theory, people should be better. I think to me, there's like you get like I, I blog publicly about like functional hierarchies, which I don't like. I prefer uh, more, you know, manage the, the closer the people are in a management hierarchy. I think the more they are um, uh, feeling towards the same goal. That, of course, causes other problems. Though. It's, not, it's not like it's a perfect solution. So I, I'd say in general, like th this sounds like a trite answer, but but like this. The more that managers realize that they need to work sideways to keep good relationships, no matter what the org chart says, that solves the most problems. And the more their leadership is about that rather than artificial things like KPIs. So, so, so the more management is evaluated on relationships rather than abstract notions of are you hitting your goals? I, I think that just leads to better things. Now it does, does challenge the scale as well. So I'd say firstly, anyone who's a manager and even like a senior engineer or a staff engineer, a lot of your job is building good relationships because in the end, these people do have different viewpoints and they're, they're, just, they're coming from good places, but it's going to mean conflict in, in, in addressing them. I'd say that's the biggest one, regardless of what the, the hiring chart says or whatever. Um, you know, the, 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 the thing I hate the most as an engineer to a manager is how many managers does it take to change a light bulb? And that happens when people start not trusting their peers anymore and wanting to escalate. So, so I'd say pushing down and emphasizing trust. Uh, but, you know, I'd say like Datadog has grown a lot and we constantly struggle with it because what worked well, at, you know, maybe when you had 30 directors, stops working when you have 100 directors. So you're constantly have, having to find new mechanisms. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I, I mean, I think that was the most valuable. I had a, uh, a mentor as an engineer, you know, uh, coming up. And, and one thing he advocated to me was reaching out across departments, doing small things for people that they ask and just being able to, you know, use that kind of, create that good deed that opens up that communication. Now they start trusting you more. They know that you care. You want to do things for them. You want to help them out. And then they start to help you out. And yeah, that's what I've heard some people use. And it, uh, it's like social capital, which, which comes from yeah. a different place, but it's totally the same thing. Like it's, it's just this trust that when things go wrong, we're on the same side, as opposed to you screwed up and what are you going to do about it? So the more that people can keep the dialogue there at the, the trust, it's, but it does require you to be proactive. As you say, if you, if you wait until too late and it's like, oh, you screwed up yeah. and you don't have a relationship, it, it, you can't really expect them to be able to help you as much as they could if you've worked ahead of time. <laughs> really good point. Um, <clears throat> next question uh, from Vasily. How would you, how would you structure teams and, and organize their collaboration to do both uh, continue evolving product and building a new platform. I think you touched on this already a bit. Yeah, I, I'm an Amazonian heart, which is this whole two pizza team. You build it, you, yeah. run it, you run it. But then it, that does lead to the how do you build the tiger team or the two pizza person carlo? Again, ideally, if, if it's small, like if, if you get to like five people needing to work on the V2, it's different. Then you have two teams. But again, to me, the closest 
under it. But honestly, the ideal V2 is under the exact same manager who owns the V1, like because then they are the one who can keep that relationship well. The more you add layers to the hierarchy, the more you're just asking it, it's asking more and more people to collaborate to keep the relationship good. And more than anything, I think it's that relationship that makes helps the V2 to succeed. But the V1 people are happy to help the V2 team as opposed to resenting the V2 team. That, 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 um, we're probably all seeing cases of that. <laughs> yeah. Which is super important because V1 is changing. I mean, it's supporting production. It's, it's, it's not like the static thing that's just I duplicate over here. It's constantly evolving. Um, is building a parallel system that routes all the requests to the old system while incrementally serv servicing some of them a good approach? I'd say it depends on the size of the problem. Like, so, so I'd say at Datadog, uh, we've had great success with this technique, uh, sort of shadow, shadowing traffic, um, but on smaller projects, right? So, uh, so, so, so on smaller projects early on. For our larger projects, like Husky I talked about, they were doing shadow reads. Uh, to be sure that we had consistency and performance uh, for about three months before we went. So, so I think it's I think it's a great technique. I think you have to do it to actually have confidence the V2 system's doing it. But mm -hmm. where you do it in the time lag, is this, is this a pre-release thing or something you're doing all throughout it, using it as an iteration process? Really comes down to I think how big it is. The bigger the bigger bones maybe it needs, the more you push it to a validation step. The more that though it's just two engineers who can get something in production quickly learning from it. I, I think I think you're you're well off doing that. So so I, I think. I think the answer is probably both. Like, yes, and, and when you do it is very de determined by the size of it. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Uh, so as we can see, there's about a minute left, so I'm gonna start wrapping it up. Thank you everybody for your questions, the Play-Doh community, thank you all. And especially Ian, it's, it, it was an honor to do this engineering Q&A with you. So a great presentation, I really appreciate the knowledge share and, and the examples, that was fantastic. Thank yeah, you so great, much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Joe, for hosting and uh, uh, very much enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. And and thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Uh, the next Engineering QA will be on January 12th of 2023, featuring Shopify CTO. Uh, you can already register. The link has been posted in the comments. So thank you, Plato community. Thank you, Ian. And have a wonderful rest of your day.